we're currently working on a, a vaccine strategy for the uh, SARS-CoV-2 um, virus that this, this is growing out of um, cancer research strategies that we've been applying for the last quarter century and, and are now um, working together with, uh, with partners to, uh, to move this rapidly to the clinic. It actually wasn't developed as a vaccine. It was developed as a way to augment the immune response at the tumor site. So essentially to make an in situ vaccine. And what it was doing, this was work from Oncosec um, in San Diego. They would actually, um, with needles, inject plasma DNA for the IL-12 around or into the tumor, and then electroporate that plasma DNA into cells to get expression of the IL-12 cytokine. That IL-12 cytokine can then boost um, the, the immune response by augmenting priming of the type 1 immunity or a destructive immune response. It can also work to activate uh, the um, innate component of the immune response, particularly in natural killer cells, which have anti-tumor activity. So this is now being used to uh, give the, the IL-12 along with the, um, the plasma DNA that encodes the, um, the, the spike uh, protein of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus. My, my academic lab, um, I, I met here at the Early Childs Research Institute, we've been collaborating with Oncosec to, uh, I, to study the patients who get this treatment, and so we get biopsies of patients before and after treatment, and we see that there's a, that tumors that were cold you can now see an influx of, of, of T cells, of the anti-tumor T cells in the, into the tumor. So we could see that. And so we were having this discussion with them uh, on, on February, on, on March 10th. And at the end of that discussion, we brought up the idea that we should be doing something in the, uh, like for COVID-19. And so that led to us putting together a, a project in very short order um, and submitting an, an IND to the FDA in, in, in less than three weeks. And essentially, it was taking their, their plasma DNA that they had already get, taken through the FDA for IL-12, and it, it took us working with um, a spin-out biotech from our institute that, that, um, that I'm also the, the CEO of uh, to start manufacturing that, that new plasma, a plasma for the virus, um, in, in very short order. And, and so that, that was what really led us to get to the point where we could do this very quickly. But it was really just sitting around talking about what needed to happen, uh, what we needed to do something. These were remarkable times. Um, and it's a, I, you know, I hope this is a once in a lifetime occurrence. And I think I felt that we were very prepared. We had all the resources we needed uh, because of philanthropy for our research institute that we could rapidly move and repurpose something that had been used in cancer and all of our knowledge with cancer vaccine strategies to come up and, 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 and develop and implement um, this to develop a clinical trial. So the spike we're using is a spike uh, that Oncosec has licensed from the um, NIAID. Uh, this is from Barty Graham's lab at NIH. Um, that's, that's the stabilized a trimer of the spike, uh, the, the SARS-CoV-2 spike that was published in Science uh, February of, of 2020. So um, that plasmid came back to, to the Institute. Um, we actually then, uh, my colleague, Dr. Hong Ming Hu, uh, put that into um, uh, uh, an expression vector uh, plasmid. And then that is actually what then UBVAC, which is the company that we spun out of Providence here 15 years ago and works on cancer vaccines. That company is now manufacturing that, um, that plasmid under GMP um, conditions uh, to make clinical grade material. Um, that material will then be used um, uh, in patients where patients will either receive the plasmid alone, um, which will then be electroporated, or they'll get the plasmid and IL-12 that will be electroporated. Uh, Patients will get um, a vaccine at, at the, the normal volunteers, the subjects will get vaccine um, at, at day zero and then a booster at day 28. Uh, we, ex we expect to study these patients in, in great depth, looking not just at, at serology for 
different viral subunits, but also to look at T cell responses um, to the spike protein as well as the nucleocapsid protein. Um, we're also doing, of, of course, uh, kind of more advanced single cell sequencing to look at T cell receptor and B cell receptors of, of the, the patients who are the individuals that are being vaccinated on this study. We'll start with the fact that we think from what's been reported, it's still early, but it appears that many patients who get the virus um, may have a weaker immune response to the virus. And even some patients that appear to have recovered have got very low or possibly even undetectable antibody responses to the virus. Um, and so we don't really know if that's problems with the assays that are being used or if that's actually true. Um, we, it does appear from looking at a lot of the literature that's coming out of China, since they're ahead of us in terms of being able to evaluate patients, that there's a wide variation in um, reports of, of T cell immunity and B cell immunity. So I, I think, and, and then you couple that with the possibility, and I think it's still early, it's not all clear, but the possibility that, that people who have recovered from the virus um, may actually develop the virus or viral symptoms again and be able to shed virus. We don't know. I think it's unclear if uh, that's because of a false negative reading and that they still had virus um, on, on the PCR test, but it wasn't detected on that PCR test. So they, they had virus, but wasn't detected. And it's essentially the virus was just resurging again in those individuals. Or if, in fact, people had cleared the virus um, did not have the virus and were re-exposed somehow and, and had developed the, uh, the COVID-19 disease again. Um, those are, are questions that we don't really know. There's, again, conflicting data. And, and so I think what that's telling us is that if that's true, or even if there's just weak immune responses, we're probably going to need some kind of vaccine to be able to boost immunity and keep immunity high so that people are protected from, uh, from the disease. We're, we're really um, you know, pushing quite hard on our side to be able to start vaccinating people in May. Uh, I think it's, um, it's really in the hands of the FDA, um, which are, again, the, the FDA is getting inundated with, with calls all over the place. And, and so those folks are working very hard, I know, to review all these different protocols. Um, it's also on, on our company, UBVAC, to make sure that we can get everything done that we told the FDA we would do. Um, we're, we're employing uh, a lot of the resources in our institute. So our institute has uh, full CLIA molecular uh, capabilities that are led by Dr. Carlo Bifulco there and, and Brian Pining's lab. They're working to help us do sequencing so we don't have to send things out. Um, so we're just manufacturing everything on site because, as you can tell, you know, lots of centers uh, with, with the lockdown, a lot of things are delayed um, and the capabilities to get things manufactured from CROs is, is, is on a very, very long timeline. But by manufacturing everything in house and taking full control of the situation, we're able to move very, very quickly, um, which is what we think we need to do at this point. Uh, so that, that's why we think the May timeline is realistic. And, and we're hopeful that if we can get the trial started in May, um, that we'll have a readout in that in about 60 to 90 days. And we're already planning follow-on trials that um, we'll, we'll use, again, the Oncocyte technology, as well as potentially uh, look at, at heterologous prime boost strategies that may include proteins that, that, uh, that UBVAC is, is working on. Um, and maybe we'll do some combinations with, with those. Um, or other strategies. Uh, we're really thinking that um, a lot of the things that we use in cancer immunotherapy and cancer vaccine strategies are things that have never really been tried in viral immunity uh, because viral immunity, you can give a vaccine typically for many things and get good immunity just with an adjuvant that is included in the vaccine, right? But in, in cancer, it's not that simple. You have to do uh, more complicated steps. And so I think from coming at it from a cancer perspective, um, we're not uh, shying away from employing strategies that we use now um, and that are being employed in kind of state-of-the-art cancer vaccine trials for this disease. And I think 
from that side, we're probably very fortunate to have Ankasek as a collaborator because they're very forward thinking. I think they've gotten the strategy of combining uh, their 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 strategy with uh, anti PD one from Merck and are are really pushing the envelope in um, in the diseases they're working at in, in, in melanoma and in breast cancer. So I think it's we're very lucky to have them as 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 partners and collaborators on this. We were able to move so quickly because of philanthropic support. I think in our country, uh, the support from the National Institutes of Health and, and support for programs at the CDC um, had been reduced over the years. And, and if it wasn't for institutes uh, or for the philanthropy that our institute re received, um, in my case, I have an endowed chair, uh, which, which uh, the Harder family bestowed on, on me and our institute I was able to raise money from many other people and that's what's made a huge difference and allowed us to move so quickly. One of our donors stepped forward with a $2 million uh, donation to support the, uh, the SARS-CoV research. And that'll go to lots of different projects, not just to what I'm working on. But, but we still need more resources. And I think um, this is a wake-up call that we need to be supporting more generally um, biomedical research at the academic level. Uh, because it's, it's notable, I think, that labs like Barney Graham's at the NIH, who's studying coronaviruses for right on, he's probably studied for more than 30 years, that that little known virus that was in bats, you know, is something that has now affected the global population. And if it wasn't for people like Barney Graham, who, who have been studying this virus, we'd be really in big, much, big, much bigger trouble than we are today.